Hello and welcome to my talk on computational design and optimization of future plasmonic materials and nanostructures. My name is Joost Adam. I am an associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark, and I'm the leader of the computational materials group in the Department of Mechanical and Electrical Engineering. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to this talk. So why are we looking at plasmonics in the first place? To this end, I'd usually like to show this very nice diagram of Bongasma and Shalaev, who dissected the critical device dimension versus the operating speed in four, let's say, regions. One is the past, where you have low operating speeds and rather large device dimensions. Then if you keep the device dimensions high, but the operating speeds higher in this past region, then you, you end up with something in dielectric photonics. If, on the other hand, you keep the speed rather low and um, reduce the critical device dimensions, then this is covered in the semiconductor electronics region. And if you want very high speeds combined with very low critical device di dimensions, then this region is covered by the metallic nanoplasmonics. And that's why we are very interested in still developing further and further future materials in this area. So how do we model plasmonic materials? We propose a combined molecular to mesoscale modeling approach where we can tackle the, the um, structures build of material by classical Maxwell's equations, so light matter interaction in the feature size of, um, of our wavelength. So we have the classical Maxwell's equations, and then you, we are free to tackle them with either analytical methods for high symmetry situations, rigorous or semi-analytical methods for, let's say, one-dimensional, two-dimensional structures, and discretization methods like FTTD or FEM for the case where the structures are getting more and more complicated. How do we combine materials with these simulations? They are basically governed by the electric permittivity epsilon, and classically these can be modeled by the so-called root model, and they cover mainly the interband transitions, so they are valid only in the low uh, energy regime. You can see that at this uh, red dotted curve here. This would represent a realistic epsilon curve quite well in the high wavelength regime, but in the low rate wavelength regime, there's nothing to represent the, let's say, total losses of a material. And therefore, you need to do something in this higher energy or lower wavelength region, and this is covered by Lorentz terms. So today, I want to talk about a combination of density functional theory for the uh, atomic scale simulations with electromagnetic modeling on the uh, let's say mesoscale, and what we do is we can we start with up in issue so density functional theory simulations. We extract dispersion permittivity, and then we we let's say compare this with experimental results if possible, or we make sure that our simulations are stable enough with phonon and energy considerations. Once we consider our model verified, we extract the optical parameters. And then we initialize the data for the electromagnetic modeling via the definition of either Drude Lorentz models or a data set for the dispersive epsilon values. And then in the engineering region, we go on with the electromagnetic modeling, we can, and then we can fully digitally evaluate um, the device's performance based on the material properties and the geometric considerations. We are basing our work on density functional theory. So this numerically solves the quantum mechanical systems governed by Schrodinger's equation. And the problem with Schrodinger's equation is that the full Hamiltonian for the system consists of a large number of interacting particles. And since that gets too cumbersome to calculate for a vast number of particles, we do some approximations. So we go from a many body interacting problem to a non-interacting or one electron cohn sharm equation system together with an effective potential V effective, which reduces the complexity enormously. Once we have a relaxed system from the density functional theory, one can in principle extract various material parameters from our DFT calculations. So today I'm concentrating on the optical parameters. So what we do here is we relax the structure to uh, ground state energy. And then we look at usually the electronic properties, the energy band structure and the density of states. And from there, we move on to extract the optical properties with a specific 
emphasis on the contribution of interband transitions because we need the higher energy regime for plasmonics. So in the following, I want to show some of our latest works on uh, alternative plasmonic materials. I want to introduce today the transparent conducting oxides, which is al aluminum doped Z and O in our case. I want to talk about the intermetallic family members, members zirconium nitride, which is an excellent plasmonic material, very, very close to the behavior of gold. And then I want to talk about silicon, where you can also introduce plasmonic behavior and nanostructures like small silicon nanowires. So let's start with the first example, the aluminum doped zinc oxide. What we do is we use uh, the siesta code for our DFT calculations, and we organize the AZO in, into a crystal structure. So we, we organize this in a, in a periodic supercell, and then we basically exchange one of these atoms here by aluminum. One of the biggest problems in uh, classical DFT is that DFT usually underestimates the band gap. And there are several proposed um, solutions for that. What we are using is the so-called so Hubbard correction or DFT plus U. And once you have tuned the parameters correctly, you can come up with a material uh, model that is very close to the recent developments in uh, experiments. So for instance, here you can see that we start off with ZNO as a pure semiconductor. And then what you see is that it proposes a band, uh, a band gap of 0 0.9 electron volt, which is not resembling the experimental results. Once you apply the Hubbard correction, you create a band gap of 3.1 electron volts in line with experimental findings on zinc oxide. So then we start doping by introducing aluminum into our cell and we go to an uh, two per atomic percent doped aluminum. And this shifts the Fermi level upwards and increases the conductivity of zinc oxides. And then we investigated another case, which is experimentally not represented at the moment. So we went for six per atomistic percent and um, there even more electrons uh, accumulated around the Fermi energy and we get an enhanced metallic behavior. So once we had this density of states done, we extracted the optical parameters or what you can see is when you when we look at uh, classical zinc oxide then the uh, result without the Hubbard correction doesn't get close to the experimental result at all. When you introduce the Hubbard correction, the absorption edge shifts to 3.1 electron volts, which is very much in line with these results recently published. Then again, if we introduce the two atomic percent aluminum, this shifts the absorption edge to the blue. And then in the AZO6 case, the metallic uh, behavior is even further enhanced. It, it shifts the absorption edge further to 4.5 electron volts. So this is the behavior we expect from a 6% aluminum doped zinc oxide. So what did we investigate from there? We had a look at AZO splittering uh, resonator meter materials. So these are materials where these metallic uh, U-shapes are arranged in a, in, a, in a periodic lattice. And then they get these uh, splittering resonator characteristics. So you get a magnetic resonance and an electric resonance. LC modes and plasmonic modes. And in both cases, we found out that by increasing the dop doping level to 6.25 atomic percent, we create not only stronger magnetic and electronic modes, but also higher plasmonic performance, which can be seen in these two graphs down here. Okay, so now to this intermetallic material, zirconium nitride. And here we again started from atomistic simulations with the siesta package. We extracted the density of states and came up with NK values and epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 values. And again, we compared this to recent experimental findings. So of course, only up to four electron volts. And after that, we provide much further material into the higher energy regime. And again, we had a look at these meter material applications again with split ring resonators, very much the same as before. And you can see that by varying the geometry of these uh, split ring resonators, you can shift the plasmon a little bit. You again have these LC modes 
So it's proposed as an excellent alternative for meter material applications. Another question you can ask yourself is whether they, this would work also in classical nanoparticle scattering scenarios. And here the gold standard is uh, literally gold. So we compared our ZRN nanospheres to gold nanospheres. And you can see here that in principle, the resonances in scattering and absorption you get from a zirconium nitride sphere are a little bit wider than the ones you get from gold. But in principle, they show a very, very similar behavior. So if you look at the thin film behavior of this in a classical Kretschmann combination, you will see that again, the resonances in Kretschmann angle that uh, are created by gold are uh, sharper. But you have the same behavior also for zirconium nitride, just a little bit with shallower resonances. So in principle, sensing works fairly the same way as with gold. It's just that you sacrifice a little bit of these resonance sharpness. So in, in applications where you need a lot of stability, this might really be a very valid alternative to classical gold. Now, for the surface plasmon resonances in silicon nanowires, we DFT calculated the uh, bulk material for silicon and you have this negative epsilon one value which basically predicts plasmonic behavior in this regime beyond four electron volts so our prediction was uh, to find plasmonic resonances in bulk silicon in this energy regime and then together with our partners from uh, cnr imm we established so-called EELS spectroscopy results of the silicon nanowires, only 30 nanometer in diameter and 200 or to 400 um, nanometers in length. And what we could see is that these structures exhibit a combination of surface plasmon resonances with standing waves introduced by the length of these nanowires and then also transverse plasmons introduced by only the width of these nanowires. So in principle, we were uh, able to reproduce with our DFT calculated materials in full wave FEM simulations, exactly the behavior that was seen in these very, very exciting nanometer resolved pictures from, from uh, electric energy in silicon nanowires. A word on our recent simulations in terms of nanoparticle arrangements for sensing applications. So with our partners at uh, Nanogune, we worked on colloidal nanoparticle self-assembly. So first of all, you have nanoparticles in solution, which then by a specific process is transferred to a substrate and they self-align in these amazing nanostructures. And what you have here is a combination of a, um, a lattice effect with the plasmonic near field effect coming from, in this case, for instance, one single bead, but also by the combination of several beads. So our modeling approach here to support the experimental work was first of all to extract the normalized extinction profiles from particles in solution and together with me theory to predict the exact materials and the shell characteristics. So we optimized for the proper material parameters. Then on the other hand, on the fabricated substrates, we performed a statistical image analysis on the particle cluster size, for instance. So how many beads are in one cluster in this uh, example here? And putting it all together, we could come up with full wave simulations predicting the spectroscopic behavior of these arrangements. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce to you a project that we develop in our group, and it's called the Photonic Materials Cloud. It's a fully interactive tool for the creation, the comparison, and the, let's say, digital testing of optical materials. It's a high-performance, computationally-backed online calculation tool for particle and thin film optical response. You can import and export materials and structures so for instance, you can take materials from the refractive index.info database. You can create your own materials by putting together Drew Lawrence parameters. You can upload files. And of course, you can also create constant refractive index materials. So once you, can, you have created your list of materials, 
you can compare those and you can also use these particles completely freely for particle scattering online simulations and for thin film response simulations. So then again, you can export publication ready graphics. You can also export your data to CSV files. And in the whole mix here, you can also save your created materials to data files for later use. Please have a look photonicmaterials.info. You're welcome to use it and contact us anytime if you have any suggestions or questions. First and foremost, I would like to thank my team, the SDU Computational Material Group, then of course our partners, and I would like to thank also our funding organizations. We had splendid support by the U Cloud Services of SDU eScience in terms of HPC computing. Please visit our homepage and photonicmaterials.info. Thank you very much for your attention.